All right. How we doing, church? Everybody good? Some of you are. Some of you need a little more coffee or something or another donut. I don't know. We're glad you're here, man. We're excited. And uh, how about that song, Blessing? Isn't that a cool song? I mean, we're singing a blessing over you guys. I don't know if you realize that, but uh, it's, it's praying scripture, singing scripture is uh, what was taking place there. And, and I love the fact that, you know, uh, most of us like to be uh, on the receiving of the blessings, right? And so that's praying and singing a blessing. And, and I don't know if you listen to the lyrics and hopefully as you sang these back to God, you realize that it's talking about not just here and now, but it's talking about for generations and generations. I mean, it's to me, it's moving and stirring and it's a beautiful song that is talking about a blessing. And uh, today we're in, a, we're in Song of Songs, a Song of Summer, and we're talking about another song. We're talking about Psalms 23. You may not think of it that way. Most of you know Psalms 23, and you know, you think of uh, King David, and you think of you know, being a shepherd and all that kind of stuff. And so there's some things that we're going to unpack today, and there's a lot to unpack in this passage. Uh, but most of us know that one, right? I mean, we may even have it memorized, or maybe uh, we've got it on the wall somewhere. You know, but it's a powerful text. It's a powerful song, if you will, that uh, King David wrote. And uh, so we're going to look at that today, and it talks about the Lord is my shepherd. And uh, if you're watching online, welcome. Uh, glad you guys are here today. You guys can look in the room, can look over, and we've got communion set up. So at the end of the service, we'll be sharing a communion. So if you're watching online, if you don't mind, go ahead and when you get a chance, grab uh, some elements. And just All you need is some bread and some, uh, some juice or whatever, and it'll suffice for what we're doing today. But it's really a time of reflection, uh, a time of inspection, and a, a time of uh, just celebrating the cross of Christ and, so, uh, and what He did for us. And so that's, that's what communion and the Lord's Supper is really about. And uh, so we're going to do that at the end of the service. So really, to me, this passage really kind of points us to the Good Shepherd and uh, it reminds us that, uh, you know, that God, how much God loves us. And so as we even prepare for communion, I think this text will help uh, get us there. So uh, Jesus is a good shepherd. So let me read with, I want to read the, the whole passage to you. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Man, that's a good one right there. That's a, that's a great passage. And so we think about, you know, Jesus is the good shepherd. You know, and so whenever uh, we, we read this passage, we think about, all right, well, that's David, Mike. You know, David is the one that wrote Psalms 23, and, uh, but Jesus is the good shepherd. We read about that in John chapter 10. And, and so, but David understood what it was to be a shepherd. Uh, most of us know, you know, that even whenever he was anointed by uh, Samuel, you know, he was left in the field watching the sheep, right? And so they brought, bring in all the brothers, and they're sitting there, and they're going, and Samuel's like, hey, is there, a, is there another son? Do you have another son? He goes, yeah, he's out watching the sheep. So they bring him in, and Samuel's like, this is the one. So he anoints David as the king right there, you know, in front of his brothers, and it says the Spirit of the Lord was on David. And, uh, and so David knew what it was to be a shepherd. You know, later, whenever he would uh, fight Goliath, one of our favorite stories, right? You know, David goes out to fight Goliath, and, and uh, everybody's like, man, you're just a boy, you know, uh, you know, he, you may, he may have been small, ruddy, whatever, but he was a bad dude. I'm just telling you. So he had already, he tells, you know, the, 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 the king, he said, hey, listen, man, I've had lions attack. I've had bears attack. He said, and I go to them and I attack them. And I, you know, if they snatch a, a sheep or whatever, I club them and I take it away from them. I'm thinking, man, that's a bad dude, right? And so he's willing to fight all that. And so for him, Goliath is like, man, this is nothing. I don't know if you guys ever watched National Geographic, but uh, there's a, or stuff like that, but there's some videos of like some big bears getting in, in a fight. Um, like a couple of grizzly bears get into a fight. I mean, it is a bad deal. I wouldn't want to be anywhere in that. Right. And you watch it. And what, I, I saw one where the, the, the guy, one of the bears is tore up from the other one, but man, he's still fighting and going at it. And I'm thinking, and David would go up and club that club that that's a bad dude. I'm just telling you. So David understood what it was to be a shepherd, but so does Jesus. And David would constantly point to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? So, so I love the fact that David is kind of talking to us and he's saying, hey, listen, he understands when it says the Lord is my shepherd. He understands that. He understands the role. He understands the sheep. He understands, you know, uh, the roles of the shepherd. He understands all that. And so Jesus is the good shepherd. So we read this in John chapter 10. 
And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So what do we just talk about David? David, he was willing to lay down his life to defend the sheep, right? Fight a bear, fight a lion, fight a wolf, whatever. And so David was willing to lay down his life to fight, you know, off whatever, but he was willing to do that for the sheep. When we look at Goliath, he was willing to fight Goliath for all his brothers and all his family and all his, his countrymen, right? He was willing to lay it down. So Jesus is the beautiful picture of a great shepherd. He is the good shepherd. And so he says, I am the good, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So as we gather around these tables and we'll take a piece of bread and we'll take a juice and we'll come back and we'll sit at our, 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 our uh, seat or whatever, we'll, have, we'll think through what Jesus did. And what we're doing is we're celebrating the Jesus, the, the fact that Jesus was willing to lay down his life. He was laid down on a cross. He was nailed to a cross for your sins and my sins. So we celebrate that. Isn't that crazy? We go, man, that's crazy that you celebrate the death of your Savior. But see, Jesus talked about in the same passage that death had no hold on him. God had given him authority over death. He could lay down his life and take it up again, right? And so it's a beautiful picture that we read here in John. It says the hired hand is not the shepherd and, and does not own the sheep. And so here's the thing, for the believer who has put his faith in Christ, we belong to Jesus. We, we are his sheep, right? He is our shepherd. And so we, we have surrendered our life. We said, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we surrender everything to him. So we put our faith in him. We've surrendered our life to him. We've sur surrendered all control to him. And we say, you know what? We trust you. We follow you. We surrender our life. And so the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And so what Jesus is talking about here is the difference between one who just kind of watches or helps out, just kind of a hired hand. But for somebody who is vested, who this is their livelihood, this is their, this is their body, he said, hey, this matters. And so he's willing to do whatever it takes, but the hired hand is just willing to run off. So then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters. And let me just tell you, the enemy, the wolf, is going to attack. The enemy, the wolves, the lions, the bears, whatever you want to call it, the enemy is going to attack. Too often in this life, I think we, you know, we think, hey, man, you know, I'm just going to give my life to Jesus and everything's going to be hunky-dory. No, you're going to go through troubles. You said in this world, you'll have troubles and you'll have trials and you'll have tribulation. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world, right? And so oftentimes we wonder, why am I going through this? Because Jesus said, that's what will happen. I mean, the storms don't go away. The wolves don't go away. But the shepherd is there. And that's what we have to keep our focus on is the, the fact that the shepherd is there. So the, the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. The enemy doesn't care about the sheep. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he doesn't care anything about anything. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So I think it's important for us to be reminded of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, I know my sheep. So here's the thing. There's no question. Jesus know who, knows who belongs to him. Well, the question is, I think sometimes what we wrestle with is we wonder, hey, man, do I belong to Jesus? You know, am I just religious? Have I just prayed a little prayer? You know, have I, have I truly surrendered my life? Do I really belong to him? Have I given up control to him? Have, have I given him everything? Have I laid down my life and said, I, I choose to die, crucify my, 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 myself. I want to die to self and I want to live for you. And, and so I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So for the believer, for the one who's put their faith in Christ, you know, Jesus is your savior. You know, without a shadow of a doubt, there's no question in your mind. You know what? You know that. And so Jesus said, Hey, listen, we know each other just as the father knows me. And I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So what he's saying, hey, listen, there's a love relationship here. There is an incredible relationship between me and the Father. And, and what he's saying is between me and the sheep. There is a love relationship. God cares about us. He wants that relationship. Like we talked about last week, he knows everything about me, but he loves me, right? He cares about me. And so Jesus said, I, I am the good shepherd. And so let's look back at Psalms 23 again. So the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. What if we really had that mentality? And so what David is saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I have nothing. I mean, I, I, I lack nothing. There's nothing I need. I got everything that I need. I mean, he is all that I need. And so it's, it's, if I've got the shepherd, if I've got the good shepherd, if I've got Jesus, he's all that I need. And so what if we really had that mentality? But he said, man, I lack nothing. I am blessed. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. 
So he says, man, I lack nothing. I'm blessed. We just prayed a blessing over you guys, sang a blessing over you guys. We pray blessings over y'all before y'all ever get here. Every Sunday morning, we pray for whoever walks through those doors. Yeah, they'll be blessed. They'll hear the word of God. And we even pray for conviction. We're going to talk about that today. We pray for conviction that the Holy Spirit would illuminate areas of your life that don't honor God, that would literally bring you closer and closer to a, a, a right relationship with God the Father. And so we pray that for you guys. But he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. There are times, you know what, we don't, you know, we're always on the go. We're go, 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 go. And there are times that God will literally just make you rest. And that's what he's saying that the shepherd, the good shepherd does. There are times he makes us rest. You know, I don't know about you, but there are times if you go, 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 you often get sick. And then you have no choice but to rest, right? Uh, you get something or you're going through something and you can't do anything but just sit and be still or lay there. And, and, and you go, you know what, man, I, I have got to learn to rest. And a lot of us, man, we're always on the go because we don't want to miss out on anything, right? We're, we're going, going, going. We've got to be able to say, God, help me to slow down and rest. And we've got to make sure that we take time to rest. So what he says is God will make him rest. The shepherd will make him rest. He makes the sheep lie down. They're getting tired. They're getting weary. He looks around. He takes an assessment of them. And he says, hey, listen, right here, we're going to lay down here. And he kind of herds them up, he brings them in, and he makes them rest. And so God will do that to us. And, and so whenever we do that, we're getting the rest that we need. And here's the thing, a lot of times whenever we get rid of, and we're not so weary, we're not so worried. When we're rested, and we're refreshed, and we're renewed, man, it's a good place to be. He leaves me quiet, beside quiet waters. You know, sheep, you know, they were, they were important to the shepherd because they produced a lot of things. They uh, they, they needed to produce more because the wool that came off them became clothing and blankets and all kinds of things like that. But also that wool would accumulate on these, these animals. And so they couldn't go down and just drink in rushing water. The wool would, could get saturated and they could go into the water. Could, you know, so they had to have quiet, small pools. So the shepherd would literally at times even dig a little pool where the water would come over and they would drink from that. So he was watching out for them, making sure they didn't go into the water. And if they did, he had that shepherd's crook, whatever, he could pull them back out, right? So he's watching over them. He's protecting them, not only from the animals, but from themselves. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. So I think about he refreshes my soul. I don't know if you've ever felt like your soul was heavy or burdened or troubled. I mean, I, I think I've shared with you guys when the, the, the night that I gave my life to Christ, I was troubled in my soul because I wanted to know Jesus I wanted to understand salvation. I wanted to be saved. I wanted to know, man, where would I spend eternity? So my soul was troubled. And so it says he refreshes my soul. Uh, I don't know if you got, you know, so I know I'm giving my age away on this, and y'all can probably look at me and tell I'm old anyway, but, but if y'all remember the nasty plunge where they would take drink some kind of nasty tea and they would fall back into a pool, and it was like so refreshing, like you had to have that tea. I don't even know if that tea's around anymore. But anyway, I'm just saying, do anybody remember that? Anybody, any other old folks in here, y'all remember that? How about, how about zest? Anybody remember zest? zestfully clean y'all remember that there was this soap that they would literally uh, they would get in the shower they can barely get in there you know and and they, you know like they can't hardly you know it's steaming like crazy like the hot water probably wake you up but they would smell this soap and like whoo you know they were all, they were awake they were ready to go charge in, you know into the week and you go you know that soap really didn't do that but it was a picture of being refreshed the tea was a picture of being refreshed right and and, and so what you do is you go you know god i need my soul to be refreshed and i think all of us need that there are times we need a revival, and there's times we need refreshing, right? And so David says, he refreshes my soul. And sometimes I think he does that through a moment or through, through a conversation or through an encounter with somebody, or maybe where we're serving, we're using our gifts, and we, we think we're, we're helping somebody, and God refreshes us. And so he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. God's got his name invested in this. And so for the good shepherd, for those of us that have put our faith in Jesus Christ, for those of us who said, I am born again, I'm a child of God, you know, I, I am redeemed, I am, I'm restored to a right relationship with a holy God because of my faith in Jesus, not because of anything I've done, because of what Jesus did on the cross, which we will celebrate, and through the power of the resurrection, man, I have that right relationship with him. And, and so what we do is we go, like my sins, I, I owe a sin debt. That sin debt was paid by Jesus. And so you just think about that. There's a sin debt. Jesus signed the check. That check's good. You know, he's covered me. He has washed me white as snow. And so for his name's sake, so he's, God's going to lead me on the right path because I'm his child. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. 
And so he's got a lot invested. He's, he's wrote a whole book on how to live, how to be a blessing, and how we can honor him and glorify him. And so the more that I line up with that, number one, we line up with what he says. And what he says is, hey, I'll bless you. I'll watch over you. I'll protect you. And he, here's the thing. You're going to go through storms. You're going to go through trials, but I'll be with you. And so his name is, is, is backing this up. And so here's a, a great statement. It says, me plus Jesus is enough. And that sounds good, doesn't it? But I don't know if it's always true for us. We say, me plus Jesus is enough. Or we just say, hey, Jesus is enough. That's all I need is just, just give me Jesus, you know. Uh, you know, like Ann Graham, you know, hey, just give me Jesus, you know. And that sounds good, and we can hear, listen to it, and man, it moves us and it stirs us. But I'm not sure it's always accurate of where we really are. Because most of us kind of live like me plus Jesus plus, or me plus Jesus plus, plus, plus. We want more and more to be added to that. We want Jesus, but we want all this other stuff, right? And we want, we want everything else, and so it's me plus Jesus plus, plus, whatever. And so, I, you know, I was thinking about this last night as I was, uh, I, I was just thinking about worship. And, and I was thinking, you know, we, so it, this kind of popped into my head, you know, and y'all can kind of take it for what it's worth. But, you know, whenever we're, we're saying, man, I love Jesus, do we really love Jesus? I mean, like, love him. Do you really love Jesus or do you just want him to save you? Do you really love Jesus? I'm talking about like love him, like, like, like man, just like deep, like love. You know what I'm saying? Do you love the Father? Do you love our Heavenly Father? Do you really love the Heavenly Father? And do you love the Holy Spirit? Like, do you really love? I mean, you know if you do or not, right? And so do you really love the Holy Spirit? And, and you love to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit? You love to be stirred by the Spirit? That you love the Father, you love the Son, and you love the Holy Spirit. And so just ask yourself that. Do I really love them? Or do I just really love music? Or do I really love songs? Or do I really love church? Or do I really love, you know, ministry? Or do I love these other things? Or do I really, is Jesus enough? Do I really love God? Do I really love God or do I love the things that come with God? Or do I, I just, or do I love the stuff? Is it the plus, plus, plus stuff? And so ask yourself, do I, do I really love Jesus? Here's the thing, I, I think your actions tell us that. Do I really love being the hands and feet of Jesus? Do I love to serve? I mean, you can look around and see if you're serving anywhere. Do I really love the Father to the point that I want to know more and more about Him? Do I love the Holy Spirit where I pray for conviction rather than praying that the Holy Spirit doesn't know what's going on? He does. So we have to ask ourselves, do I really love Jesus? And I, I remember whenever I was in college, I was, uh, you know, had broken off a relationship that was not a, a, a good relationship. And, and so I was like, you know, God, I, I want to just, I want to fall in love with Jesus. And, and God, I feel like I'm always adding something to that. Like I want Jesus plus, Jesus plus. And so I took about six months and I said, God, I, I want to get to the point where I just fall in love with Jesus. And I had more opportunities to date than I'd ever had. It was like, you know, like, like what in the world, you know, and what is that? That's the temptations and stuff. Uh, but I was like, you know, God, I just, I want to fall in love with Jesus. And, and literally it was a time of fasting and praying and seeking and, and really just, just understanding who Jesus was. And, and, and let me tell you, there's times I can drift away from that to where, I, hey, I want Jesus plus. And so I would just, you know, say, I think we have to, you know, God help me to stay focused on Jesus is enough. He really is. Because the world, and let me tell you, just because you're in church doesn't mean that, hey, you're there because you can have everything else and be focused on everything else. But me plus Jesus is enough. That's a great place to be. So the good shepherd, and this is talking about Jesus. You know, Jesus said he's the good shepherd. The good shepherd feeds the sheep. So hopefully even today he's feeding us the word of God, the truth of God. Uh, he, he leads the sheep. He protects the sheep. Uh, he, um, he loves the sheep and he even dies for the sheep. He's willing to lay down his life so that we might live. He's willing to lay down his life to pay for your sins so you don't have to go to a devil's hell. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to be in a relationship with him. He wants you to be in a right relationship with the Holy God. And so Jesus, the good, the good shepherd, does all of this for us, right? So God's name is on the line. So it goes back to God has to do what he says he will do. God says he will punish sin. He'll take care of that, right? God says he is a just and a righteous God. He is a God of truth. Uh, he is a God who literally does what he says. And that's not always in our timing. We often want God to move on our time. You know, we're looking at the clock going, you know, God, it's time for you to show up. It's time for you to do whatever. And God doesn't work on our schedule. We are to submit and surrender to him. But it's a, a lot of times the other way. We want him to submit and surrender to us. 
uh, because of our selfishness, our greediness, right? But we got to be able to say, God, you put your name on this. So, God, I trust you. Psalms 23, 4 says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So what King David is saying, even though I'm going to walk through a dark valley, and let me tell you, we walk through some tough times. You know, as a sheep, you're walking through this valley, there's wolves on this side, there's lions on this side, there's, there, there's bears on either side or whatever. And so this, this sheep is saying, hey, listen, I'm going to stay focused right here on Jesus. I'm going to stay focused on the shepherd. And so for us, we're going to go through tough times. And if you think anything else or someone is telling you, hey, man, it's going to be hunky-dory, they're selling you something. Jesus said we're going to go through tough times. We've got to believe him and trust him, right? But he said, hey, listen, I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. We're going to walk through this together. We're going to move through this together. So maybe it's a bad diagnosis, or maybe it's a bad financial decision, or maybe, it, you know, whatever it could be. Maybe, may, you know, maybe it's something else. You're going to say, you know what? Even though I walk through this, look what it says. I will fear no evil. I'll fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. So that rod was at times to fight off these lions, these, these things, these enemy that attack. But it was also to comfort because that, that sheep could look to the shepherd and say, hey, listen, and he's watching him sitting on the rock, maybe kind of watching it. And he's going, you know, he's got that instrument or that, that, that staff that he's going to protect me. He's going to watch over us. And he's got this. So you know what? We're going to go to sleep. We're going to lay down and we're going to have rest. And so think about how peaceful that might be for you to go, you know what? Man, Jesus has got this. I don't have to figure everything out. I don't have to know everything, but he's going to comfort me. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That seems like a crazy uh, statement there, but he says, you prepare a table before me. And so he, he said, you know, you prepare this table. There, so here's a meal. And so Jesus, the good shepherd, is sitting at this table with you, but it's in the presence of your enemies. Now, most of anybody ever had an awkward moment? Raise your hand if you had an awkward moment. Some of you guys hadn't lived yet and had an awkward moment yet. I mean, you need one, you know? And, and so, so think about you're sitting here with Jesus, and there are all your enemies around you. In the presence of your enemies, all your enemies around you. And you're sitting here with Jesus, and, you know, you're having a meal, and it'd be kind of awkward, like, you know, what are they doing here, right? You know, like, why are they here? You know, and so maybe you've never had an awkward moment, but that would kind of be an awkward moment. And then there's some of you that you would be like, <laughs> look what I'm doing. You know, you'd be rubbing it in their face, right? And then some of you would be worried about them sitting there like, well, they're looking at us. You know, all of our enemies are right here staring at us. And then some of you would be rubbing it in their face like, man, this, this roll is so good. This butter, man, this is amazing butter. You know, you would be rubbing it in. And I know that because that's just how some people are, right? But the cool thing is, is God says, hey, listen, you don't worry about the enemy. Focus on who's sitting with you at the table. Focus on who is sitting beside you. Focus on who prepared the table. And too often what we do is we get caught up in, hey, what's on the table? We get caught up on how good the stuff is on the table rather than who is with us, right? Rather than the, the good shepherd is right here beside me. The good shepherd prepared all this for me. And so we get focused on what's on the table rather than who we're with. And so we have to be careful that we don't do that. So the enemy lies to us. Th these are lies that we're told by the enemy. The enemy out there, maybe, and you wonder, why would Jesus even have them around? I'd like to have a little peace, so get them out of here. He goes, the peace comes from me being in, you being in presence with me, being in my presence, being at the table with me. So, that, hey, the enemy's going to come. The enemy's going to attack. You know, the storms are going to come. All those things are going to happen, but you got you to gotta trust me. I've got you. And, and so the lies we're told by the enemy, and these are some that many of us believe, even as believers, and I'm, I'm speaking to a lot of Christians in the room, a lot of believers that are in the room here, and a lot of those that are watching online, we, we say all this, we hear this all the time, I'm alone. I don't have anybody. I'm alone. But if we read the scripture, we know that God, Jesus even told us, he said, hey, listen, I'm going to leave and I'm going to send a comforter, and my presence will be within you. And so the very presence of God, if you put your faith in Christ for salvation, if you've come to that point of brokenness where you go, you know what, I need to be saved, I need a Savior, and Jesus, you're the only one that can do that, and we surrender our life, we actually give up everything, we say, I surrender everything to you, and we receive the gift of salvation, we just literally say, I give you my life, and he gives us life, I give him death, actually, and he gives me life, and so we give everything, we surrender to him. He, he, God says he places within us his Holy Spirit, and he seals us with that Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And so for every one of us in the room that is a believer, those that are watching online that are a believer, 
You cannot believe the lie that you're alone because God, Jesus already told you that he dwells within you. He is there. He is within you, right? So that's a lie that the enemy says because some people don't like being alone, and so it causes fear to well up, right? It causes anxiety to well up. Well up. And all of a sudden, we're afraid because we're not focused on the shepherd. We're focused on the enemy or the darkness or whatever might be around us. So that's one. I'm alone. Here's another. I'm unlovable. There, there are, you might think, well, you know, I can't seem to find anybody. Nobody really loves me. You know, nobody, nobody wants to be around me. There may be some reasons for that, and some of those might be your fault. Just going to tell you straight up. Some of those could be you, you know. And, uh, and so you might be unlovable because of how selfish you are, how self-centered you are, maybe how hard you are to get along with. You know, you know, and so you've got to be willing to work through that. But it's not that you're not lovable. God loved you enough that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for you. John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die that we might live. And so you think about the worst person that you know, the most sinful, hardest person to get along with that you know, Jesus died for them. The most corrupt criminal that's in a prison anywhere in America, Jesus died so that they might live. That's, that's mind-boggling. And so if you say, well, I'm unlovable. No, no, no. You are loved beyond measure. It's like we talked about last week. God created me. You know, Psalms 139, God created me. He knows how broken I am, but he loves me. He desires a relationship with me. And it only comes through the person of Jesus, Jesus Christ. It only comes by faith in what Jesus did. Not anything that I do or you do. But here's the thing. I am loved, and I'm loved beyond measure because of how much God loves me. The good shepherd loves me. So I'm worthless. You may even tell yourself this lie. You say, man, I'm worthless. But Ephesians 2.10 says that, you know, we are God's masterpiece. God's, God's workmanship, right? Last, last week, we covered Psalms 139. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm complex. And like we joked about, you know, some people are more complex than others, but we are complex, right? You know, and God created us. He spoke us into existence. He knit us together in the mother's womb. I mean, how beautiful is that that we're, we're, we're created by God? But here's the cool thing. So we're created by God. So every person, every believer, every person is created by God. But the person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is adopted into the family of God. And they go from being a creation of God to being a child of God. And we're adopted in him not by anything that we do. It's our faith in who Jesus is. And so we're adopted into the family of God. We're brought in. And so, man, so I am co-heirs with Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That doesn't sound worthless, does it? That sounds like, man, there's a little bit of value to who I am. So the enemy tells us that we're worthless. But Jesus says, man, you're a child of the king. You're part of the family. Then here's another one. I'm helpless. And this is oftentimes kind of an excuse that we, we do. We, we will often say, well, I'm helpless. There are things that we are helpless with, I will say that, apart from God working in that. We're powerless with things. But there is a power that works in us. The Bible says that we have resurrection power at work within us. Then the believer, there is resurrection power. Think about that. The resurrection raised Jesus from the dead, right? The resurrection power raised Lazarus from the dead. Resurrection power is throughout the scriptures that it is only the hand of God that can do that. But the Bible tells us that there is resurrection power within us. So for us to walk through life and say that we're helpless or that we don't have any power, we're denying what God says because God's word says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And so if you feel like you're powerless, it's maybe because you don't know the word of God or you're focused on the enemy rather than the shepherd. And so we've got to be able to say, God, I want you to help me understand that. So the enemy will condemn you, but God will convict you. So condemnation is you're condemned. Boom, you're done. God's done with you. God hates you, whatever. And so whenever we pray for conviction. We pray for that because that comes from God. Condemnation comes from the enemy. The devil loves to condemn us. He loves to tell you that you're done. You're toast. You're done. I mean, nobody will ever love you again. Nobody will ever trust you again. Nobody will ever want to have anything to do with you. All these things, he condemns us. That's what he does. But, but God comes with, a, with a, a, a conviction. And so it's one of the things that we pray. And when we talk about conviction, it's, it's God touching the area of our life. And said, hey, Mike, this area right here, this part of your heart, it's not surrendered to me. This part of your life is not bringing me glory. This is causing a strain in our relationship. And all you have to do is confess it and repent of it. You know what? And I'll bless you. And so there are times that we 
don't want to hear conviction either. We want to live in our sin. And then here's the thing, what we do is we justify our sin. We negotiate with God. But if he is illuminating an area, if he is bringing conviction to an area, it's because he loves you. So condemnation comes from a place of, it comes from a place of, of a hate. Condemnation comes from a posture of hate. And so the enemy hates you. P- uh, Peter said, the devil is like a, a roaring lion prowling around seeking whom he may destroy and devour. He hates you. He hates your marriage. He hates your family. He hates your witness. He hates everything about you. But he's the biggest liar in the world, and he's constantly trying to lure you into something that will destroy you. Where he wants to condemn you, Jesus wants to convict you so that you can be refreshed and restored. So conviction comes from a posture of love. He's trying to protect you. He's he's bringing conviction because he wants to draw you closer. He wants to refresh your soul, like we talked about earlier, right? So God wants to save us and restore. So think about this. It is the desire of God. God's desire is that all men would be saved. All people would be saved. So God's desire, whenever he sent his son Jesus, is to redeem the whole world, that everyone would put their faith in Christ. But not everybody will. There's some that will hear the gospel and they'll walk away. There's some that will hear the gospel and they'll argue against it the rest of their days. There's some that will hear the gospel and they'll respond by faith. And they will literally be accepted, not because of anything they did, but because of what Jesus did. But it's God's desire that everyone would hear it, receive it, and man, experience eternal life. That's God's desire. So God wants to save us, but he also wants to restore us whenever we get off path. Because here's the thing, we become a child of God. It's like a sheep that is part of the fold, but oftentimes it'll wander off. And so the shepherd has to pull him back in and restore him to the family and and restore him. So God wants to restore us. So God not only wants to save us, he wants to restore us, right? So what the good shepherd tells us, you know, we heard what the enemy says. So let's look at what the the good shepherd tells us. Jesus says he loves us. He loves us enough that he would lay down his life. He loves the sheep. He loves me. I think there are times we need to tell ourselves, you know what, God loves me. There are times I don't love myself. There are times you probably don't love yourself. There are times, you know, that we, we start listening to the lies of the enemy But I have to be reminded, you know what? God loves me. He cares about me. He wants a relationship with me. And he loves me enough that he would send his son Jesus to die for me so that I don't have to die so that I can live. And and, and so he loves me. And I need to tell myself that often. But that's what Jesus says all throughout the scriptures, man. He loves you. He wants a relationship. He is pursuing you. He's chasing after you. I don't need to be afraid. See, there are times that we go through life, and man, we, we have worry, anxiety. You know, we're just fretting over stuff that we, there's no reason to worry about that. And, and so I don't need to be afraid is what Jesus says. Hey, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Trust me. And so if I'm focused on Jesus, if I'm focused on the shepherd, I don't have to be afraid. I think about sheep, again, laying in the pasture. They look over and go, you know what? The shepherd's got this. Hey, guys, let's go to sleep. Hey, guys, let's eat. Shepherd's got it. He's watching over us. And, and what, if, what if we actually live like that? I, I was listening to a pastor last night who was preaching on uh, how too often as believers, we're afraid of death. We live with this great fear of death. He goes, why? I mean, even in John 10, 10, the passage we read, reading, Jesus says, hey, the Father's given me authority over death. I can lay down my life. I can take it up again. So if Jesus has authority over it, why are we so worried about death? If we breathe our last breath here, we breathe our first breath of heaven. If we're a believer, if we're one of his sheep, if we're part of the fold, right? So why do we live with such fear of death? It's because that's what the world is selling, and that's what the enemy is lying to you about. Hey, you got to worry about death. you got to worry about death. No, you really need to worry about living. We ought to be worried about living. Man, I want to live my life to the fullest. I want to I experience abundant life. I want to make a difference while I'm here. You know, life is but a vapor. And so I want to make a difference while I'm here rather than worrying about this fear of death. That we do all that we can to point people towards Jesus while we're here. So I don't need to be afraid. I need to be bold. I'm not alone. He is with me. We've t- covered that. He's, he's here. For the believer, he dwells within us. Now, if you're here today and you're not a believer, then you don't have the presence of God within you. He's all around you. But here's the thing. His spirit has not been placed within you. That comes when we receive Christ by, sal- for, by faith for salvation. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that is placed within us. And it only comes through faith in Christ and what he's done. And so if you've never received that, then you don't have the spirit of the living God living within you. I love the statement about Louis Giglio. He wrote a great book talking about don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Don't invite the enemy to come sit down. 
just understand that you've got enough if you've got Jesus. He says, God, our, God, our good shepherd brings us through the valley of the shadow of death. Not to the valley, but through the valley. In other words, we're going to walk through it. But he's with us, right? He's right there beside us. Our security is not based on what happens to us or what God gives us, but on his presence with us. See, the focus is on the, on the shepherd. The focus is on Jesus. And when the enemy tries to fill your heart with fear, remember who you're with. Remember who's around you, who's, who's got you, who's protecting you. Put your eyes on the good shepherd instead. That's a great quote. So we have a choice. So we have a choice. We can, cho- we can choose to focus on the problems of the world. We can choose to focus on the enemy. We can choose to focus on the news. We can choose to focus on the election. We can choose to focus on all the negativity. We can choose to focus on all that. Or we can focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We can say, you know what, Jesus, I, I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to trust you. We can focus on the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I'm going to focus on the promises of God rather than the things that I hear and the things that I see. And and it's not walking through the world blind. It's just knowing, you know what, I know who's in control. And I know who's got me. And it's like the sheep. They, they, They look to the shepherd and they go, you know what, we're good. There are lions, there are tigers, there are whatever out there. Shepherd's got us. We're good. So what if we really walk through life focused on Jesus? So we have a choice. As a follower of Jesus, you can consciously choose your thoughts and replace ungodly lives with scriptural truths. The Bible tells us we can take thoughts captive and say, you know what, I'm not going to think that. I'm going to choose to focus on the promises of God. You know, the enemy's going to hit you with lies. I mean, that's what he does. He's the father of all lies. That's what he does, right? So mentally, we are always under attack. I'm always under attack. You're under attack. And so the enemy's always kind of plant, trying to plant these seeds of doubt and, and these thoughts and these lies. And so he's always doing, that's what he does. But we can take that thought captive and say, that is a lie from the pits of hell. And I know what God's word says, so I'm going to claim God's word. That is a lie from the pits of hell. That is from the enemy. I know the good shepherd and I know what he says. I'm going to listen to what he says. And that is a lie from hell. I'm going to believe what Jesus said. And I know what Jesus has done for me. And so I'm going to put my faith and my confidence in that, not in these lies. So we have a, we have a choice. We can choose to think on the things of God or the things of this world. And so we've got to be willing to say, God, I, I choose Jesus. We have to focus on what we believe, not what we feel. This is a big one. There are so many times that we're all about the emotion. This is what this world hypes and pushes. It's all about the emotion. What feels good, do it. It's all about the feel, right? But here's the thing. What God's Word says is we do what is right in the eyes of God. We do what is truthful. And, we, and what we've got to be willing to do is say, God, I want to know what I believe, and I want to do what I believe to be truth. God, I want to know your word and I'm going to do what I believe, not what I feel. And I see, I think sometimes we're, we're always waiting for the emotional moment. And may, like I've talked to people about salvation. So well, you know, I'm just kind of waiting for that, that feeling. It's like, what are you waiting for a feeling? You've got the truth of God's word. Why are you waiting for a feeling? You know, we were celebrating last week. We've got like 140 something people that have put their faith in Christ for salvation so far this year, which is amazing. In, in the last service last week, and we had three more. So we're getting closer to like 150 people that have put their faith in Jesus for salvation. But I was looking at the baptism numbers, and there's only like a third of those that have followed Christ in believers' baptism. I'm like, hey, listen, quit waiting for a feeling. Be obedient. I mean, if you're waiting for a fuzzy feeling, you're you're waiting for the wrong thing. You need to get on the truth of God's Word and be obedient to what He says to do. And too often what we're going is, hey, I want that emotional moment. Those come and go. Those ebb and flow, but the Word of God lasts forever. And so we're obedient to the truth of God's Word. Jesus, hey, if you're going to be my follower, then do what I do. Serve. If you're not serving yet, then be obedient to the Word of God. Say, you know what? God, show me where to serve. I know y'all get tired of me talking about that, but that is part of your job as a follower of Christ is to do what He did. Follow Him in baptism. Follow Him by serving others. Wash people's feet. Tell people about Jesus. Baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's our job. And so we've got to be obedient to do those things. So it's not about what you feel, it's what you believe. And I love this last part. He says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And so David understood an anointing because he missed out on one to begin with. And like I said, Samuel had to say, is this the only one? Is this, is this all of your boys? And he goes, well, no, there's David out there, little, you know, runny David. The, so they bring David in, and Samuel anoints him. 
And, and so his, it says that God blessed David. God's spirit was on David from that point forward. Now, David screwed up. We all know that David messed up. But the love of God was still there. He was a man after God's own heart, right? And it says, my cup overflows. Whenever we put our faith in Christ, we stay focused on Jesus. I'm just telling you, there's blessings that you can't even imagine. And it doesn't matter what storms blow into your life. His peace and his presence is there. Look at this last part. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Surely your goodness and love, the love of God, will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a promise. That I know that I will be with the good shepherd. What a great promise. So my task is to focus on the good shepherd. If you want to, hey, what, what do I need to do? Focus on Jesus. Let it be about Jesus. Focus on who he is. Get to know the person of Jesus. Let Jesus be enough. Let Jesus be enough and not everything else. Not feeling like you have to add anything to it. So next step for me today, that's it. Focus on Jesus. You know, you know what? This week when things kind of go awry, I'm going to focus on Jesus. Man, whenever, you know, I don't feel like, uh, you know, anybody loves me, I'm going to focus on Jesus. I know he does. And so whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, you know, maybe you feel like your world is falling apart. Man, I'm going to focus on Jesus, the good shepherd. I want to ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. And that's what I want you to do. I just want you to focus on Jesus for a minute. Maybe you're here. Maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus for salvation. And you go, you know what, Jesus, I, f- I finally realize who you are. I finally realize what you did. And so, Jesus, with all the faith that I have, I want to put my faith in you. And I'm asking you, Jesus, will you save me? And his answer is yes. Jesus, will you change me? His answer is yes. Jesus, will you restore me? Yes. Jesus, will you heal me? Yes. Jesus, will you set me free? Yes. He'll do all those things. That's what he promises, right? Just say, Jesus, I've, I'm coming to you with all the faith that I have. I put my faith in you for salvation. And I'm asking you to come into my life, to be my leader, to be my Lord, and to be, be my shepherd. So Jesus, I surrender. I give up control. I'll give you everything. So you come into my life and take over. If you just prayed that prayer here in the room, would you just raise your hand and say, Mike, I just prayed that prayer with you. Anybody? Anybody? I see your hand right there. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Raise it high. I see your hand back here. Maybe you're watching online. Man, just let us know that. But you know what? I believe there's a lot. I know there's a lot of believers in this room. The question is, is, do you really love Jesus? Are you following him? In just a minute, the worship team is going to lead us in a song. The altar will be open. And I'll just tell you this. We're about to share in communion right after that. But the Bible teaches us don't approach that table in an unworthy manner. If there's something that you need to do business with God, do it in this time. Get your heart right. Prepare your heart and honor Jesus' death. Father, I thank you for meeting with us today. I thank you for the salvation for these that have raised their hand. God, I thank you for my salvation. I thank you for what your son Jesus did on the cross for all of us. God, I pray that you'd move in this moment, draw us close, breathe your life into us. God, help us to be obedient to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.